Thank you, Lindsay. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you uh, for joining us today. For those joining us from outside of the Calgary area, I'm Chief Constable Mark Newfeld of the Calgary Police Service. I'm the current president of the Alberta Association of Chiefs of Police. The Alberta Association of Chiefs of Police, or AACP, represents more than 7,500 police officers in the province of Alberta. The association is comprised of senior police and public safety leaders, and one of our core functions is to advocate for legislation, standards, and best practices in the interests of public safety and community well-being. We are aware that other provinces have submitted requests to Health Canada seeking an exemption from the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act that would decriminalize personal possession of illicit drugs. These are conversations that are ongoing in our province as well. With our officers being on the front line dealing currently with the, with the challenges relating to addictions, overdose deaths, mental health and homelessness that are present in our communities, we completely understand the need to consider every potential option. To be clear though, the AACP does not support the decriminalization of personal amounts of illicit drugs in Alberta at this time. While we acknowledge that decriminalization of personal amounts of illicit drugs could at some point form part of an integrated approach to redirect persons who use drugs away from the criminal justice system and towards health supports and appropriate pathways of care, we do not believe the necessary health supports, including immediately accessible treatment services, are presently available for this purpose. This is particularly true in smaller municipalities, rural Alberta, and in Indigenous communities. Based on our discussions with a sampling of rural and First Nations communities represented within our association, more robust conversations in relation to this topic are definitely required. Drug decriminalization triggers an immediate need for structural and societal changes in areas that do not currently exist. Jurisdictions that have implemented decriminalization have added a range of administrative sanctions in replacement of criminal justice outcomes. These sanctions are necessary and important so that police officers in communities are equipped with tools to address their public order and public safety responsibilities while still promoting better health outcomes for people who use drugs. This would include regulations for dealing with things like the use of drugs in public spaces, the use of drugs in areas near minors, discarded needles or other drug debris, and of course, public complaints regarding erratic or unpredictable behavior in our communities. AACP believes that any effort toward decriminalization must also include the establishment of an array of diversionary options that frontline police officers could access to connect people who use drugs with health and recovery oriented supports. These must be established prior to decriminalization so that individuals who want access to treatment can be connected to those services and supports without unreasonable delay. By itself, dec decriminalization would not reduce rates of addiction or overdose. In fact, police in our province are already operating in what is effectively a decriminalized environment. What I mean by that is that Alberta police officers generally do not charge individuals found in possession of small quantities of illicit drugs unless there are aggravating factors present involving things like serious public safety concerns or associated criminal conduct that would require that type of a response. What is required though, is a modernized public policy framework that involves all stakeholders at all levels of government, which would include health, public safety, social services, justice and prosecution, and would include representation also from rural Alberta and indigenous communities. I'll stop here and introduce my colleague, Chief Bryce Ironshirt of the Blood Tribe Police Service. Over to you, Bryce. Thank you for that introduction, Chief. I wish to speak to you from the perspective of First Nations policing or Indigenous policing. Speaking for Indigenous policing, we are currently um, under resourced due to, due to working off a fixed underfunded budget. This lack of resources has put us in a position, position where we're unable to react efficiently to any possible negative consequence to the decriminalization of possession of hard drugs. The Blood Tribe Police Service is currently uh, restructuring our indigenous, uh, currently restructuring our own indigenous based approach to the opioid crisis uh, with an emphasis on a holistic approach. Um, that being said, um, we, we don't 
recommend the decriminalization of hard, possession of hard drugs for Indigenous policing in Alberta. Uh, I will now hand it over to Chief Mike Warden from the Medicine Hat Police Service, who will provide his remarks and from the from the perspective of a smaller rural city. And thank you, uh, Chief Ironshirt, and good afternoon. My name is Mike Warden, and I am the Chief of the Medicine Hat Police Service. And I'm here to provide a policing perspective from a smaller community and share our experiences in the Medicine Hat region. In 2021, there was a dramatic increase of drug overdose deaths in Medicine Hat, more than doubling the numbers experienced in 2020. The citizens of our city, city recognize the struggling people are having with drugs, sorry, the struggle people are having with drugs and addiction issues and are looking for solutions that are effective in a move towards recovery. While the concept of decriminalizing drug possession may be one strategy in the overall fight against this public health issue, it cannot be a standalone or a singular response to this crisis. As already previously mentioned, our officers avoid charging individuals with personal possession, yet we are still experiencing these tragedies. I've spoken to many people in our community and they share an interest in a compassionate approach to the issue of addiction and ask that we develop policies and strategies that will increase recovery while ensuring these, policy, ensuring these policies do not create greater harm in our community. And that includes those struggling with addiction. We believe in strong health and social service supports and an effective, effective sanction model to tackle this health crisis in ours and other communities across Alberta. Thank you. And I'll now, we will now take your questions and I'll turn it over to the moderator. Thank you, Chief Warden. At this point, we don't have any questions in the chat box, but we'll give it just a few minutes and see if anybody comes forward with questions. We have a question from Bill Graveland. Go ahead, Bill. Hi, uh, Bill Graveland from the Canadian Press in Calgary. Um, my first question is, is why the uh, make this statement now? I mean, are you concerned that there might be a move uh, to decriminalize? Thanks, Bill. Great question. So, uh, yes, I would say that uh, we're aware of a number of applications uh, from other communities uh, across Canada. And we're also aware of discussions that are occurring in our province as well. So, um, you know, this is an application that's actually made to the federal government, to um, the um, Ministry of Health. And it isn't actually something that would require, uh, to my understanding, a uh, change in legislation or anything like that. It's, it is, it is a, an exemption that could be granted that would make this a reality. Um, you know, I, I'm not concerned that, that this is uh, moving forward in any way that's imminent, but I think it is a discussion that has been ongoing for the last, um, the last number of years, which has been intensified, obviously, by the, uh, the drug poisonings and uh, opioid overdoses. And so it's an important issue. And I think the uh, chiefs in Alberta wanted to get out and make sure that we had our voice and our position uh, known in relation to it now. Do you have a follow-up, Bill? It's on a different subject and uh, they're not gonna like it, but um, I'm just wondering if the chiefs have any comments on uh, the situation with uh, the justice minister? No. Uh, I think this, this for today, Bill, we're uh, here to talk about decriminalization. So I think we'll just stay uh, on that topic. Thank you, though. We'll move on to Chris from Global Edmonton. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, so, yeah, question for you, Chief Neufeld. Um, so we're hearing from a lot of other harm reduction advocates that they are really in favor for this. Even, you know, uh, some councillors and, and, the, and the mayor showing some favor to this here in Edmonton. Um, you know, what is the big, you know, what do you say to that? But then also what is, you know, what are some of the fears, you know, from the policing front? Are, are there concerns that this will, you know, maybe do the opposite uh, and also maybe lead to more crime? If you can talk, uh, talk about that. Yeah, there are a couple of things. I won't speak specifically, obviously, in response to anybody else's position, because there's many out there, uh, obviously. I would say, though, you know, the purpose of our association is to represent the perspective of uh, police officers, police services, and the community from, from our perspective within it. So I think uh, the concern uh, from our standpoint are a number of things. Um, number one is that we're, we're simply not ready to do this in the sense that if it were to become a reality, we don't have the administrative sanctions in place that would be required um, to deal with uh, some of the outcomes that would, would flow from it. And you know it's critical that we have that ahead of time. 
if you think about regulation for uh, the use of uh, substances, even alcohol, there's regulation about where you can consume it, um, you know, uh, transportation and these types of things. When we went to uh, decriminal, uh, decriminalization of cannabis in, uh, I believe it was 2017, 2018, a lot of work was done ahead of time as well to make sure that there were uh, appropriate regulations in place to deal with, you know, where and when you could use it and when, where you couldn't and this type of thing. You know, I think it's a, it's a complicated issue that requires the attention of folks at all levels of government. And I guess our big concern is just that if there's advocacy that's going on uh, just in certain corners looking for, you know, sort of single solutions, uh, the issue is much more complicated than that. And so we want to make sure that there's a, a good, robust dialogue involving everybody that needs to be involved to make sure that we come up with a complex solution to a complex problem and that we don't have uh, uh, experience outcomes that we didn't anticipate that are actually more harmful to our communities than what we're experiencing now. Chris, do you have a follow-up question? Yeah, uh, so just kind of with that, if the proper processes are, you know, and this, let's say this does move forward when, you know, do you, do you see that there could be some pluses with this change or some positives with this change? And also, are there any additional things that you would like to see happen? Well, I think what I would say for sure uh, is that anytime you talk about decriminalization, I think there's, um, there has to be clarity about what exactly you're talking about, because some people talk about it in isolation. And as I said, in isolation, decriminalizing um, uh, personal possession of hard drugs doesn't really change much. Um, as I said, we're effectively operating in that environment now. So if there's, uh, you know, some thinking that that's going to change, you know, addiction rates or overdose numbers or whatever, that that's, that's not certainly been our experience. But I think if you look at a, a modernized framework, as we've talked about a drug policy framework that looks at, at decriminalization as one aspect, and also looks at, uh, you know, associated aspects such as making sure the appropriate uh, treatment and uh, support options are in place ahead of time. You know, we often talk about trying to divert people who are not, who are struggling with the grips of addiction out of the criminal justice system. The issue is as we do that and we talk about, uh, you know, pathways and, and off ramps and that sort of thing, those off ramps have to go somewhere meaningful for those folks. Because if they don't, they end up back on the on ramp and right back in the grips of addiction again. So, I, like I say, those are very important that those be, be, be there ahead of time. Uh, when we talk about decriminalization, too, there's lots of discussion about, uh, about what we would call safe, safe supply or safer supply. We're talking about harmful drugs here. So, they're, they're not safe, period. But we're talking about toxicity in the drug supply that's causing some of the overdoses. And, you know, we need to look at how that would be done. That may make some sense as well in certain circumstances. But again, it's very nuanced. Uh, we want, would want to make sure that anything we do actually addresses the illicit drug market. Because if it doesn't address the illicit drug market, then people are still going to be uh, accessing uh, toxic uh, opioids. So, so again, a very, a very complex uh, subject that actually uh, requires the attention of stakeholders at all levels. And, and so, again, that's what we're advocating for is those discussions. Uh, and and a, a modernized framework could certainly be useful. Our next question comes from Tom Ross. Tom, over to you. I'll start off with um, Chief Newfelt here. Um, as you mentioned, we've already kind of effectively decriminalized uh, possession uh, in a local level here. You don't really charge it for, you know, on its own. What's the difference then if it's legislated on top of you doing it already? Sorry, Tom, you're, you're asking if, uh, if the uh, possession was to become decriminalized, what would the impact be? Yeah, essentially, because, you know, you're already sort of not charging people for small amounts of possession already. So what's the difference then if, if this legislation was brought in? Yeah, I think the big thing is that, uh, and, and, to, and to be quite clear, we're talking about decriminalization, not legalization. So even in a decriminalized environment, it is still unlawful to possess drugs. But uh, we're, what, we're, what, what that looks like in jurisdictions where that has been done is that the criminal sanctions that are currently in place are replaced by administrative sanctions or provincial legislation. And, and those are the types of things that would have to be in place because if they weren't, as I indicated with respect to the examples regarding cannabis or alcohol, you know, that would create a bunch of different issues in our community that the police officers would have no uh, tools to deal with. So what we're talking about ahead of time is if we're going to decriminalize and then we're going to uh, put in administrative sanctions, which would include um, moving people uh, toward uh, health 
a healthcare system and recovery uh, oriented supports, then those things would have to be in place. Otherwise, you know, my prediction would be that we would have much more disorder and concerns in our community than we already do. Um, do you have a follow up? Yes, uh, uh, particularly uh, I want to hear from uh, Chief Iron Shirt here. Um, we know that there's a uh, overrepresentation of uh, Indigenous populations in the criminal justice system. So, uh, you know, if this effort isn't being taken, you know, what are some efforts maybe that we should be looking at from a policing perspective on uh, on addressing that and and particularly um, getting rid of that, you know, overrepresentation issue? Okay, I. This is my understanding of things is that um, since the beginning of the opioid crisis, um, certain programs were developed uh, um, that were um, that were for the majority of people. Well, uh, Indigenous communities are very uh, close knit and the culture there is specific to them. Um, we should start looking at actually going into the communities and getting more of an input from them. Uh, we're currently doing that at the Bloodshot Police Service where we're um, um, in Blackfoot, it's called the uh, Ikanapi, Mogonodapi, the gentle way, the kind way. We're uh, getting input from absolutely everybody in the community and we're gonna use that to create our own programs. And that is, is specific to our Blackfoot culture and our beliefs. Um, I think that's the first approach in uh, looking at uh, helping our indigenous communities is actually doing uh, creating an approach that is specific to the actual community itself and being mindful that uh, each community is completely different than the next. Uh, we have to get that mindset that we're one um, universal indigenous culture and we're not, we're all, we're all different. We all have um, different understandings of life. Thank you, Chief. Our next question comes from Tim Rusch. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, hey, my question is for uh, Chief Newfeld. Um, I, I guess going off, off Tom's first question there, I, I'm still waiting for a specific answer about what would happen if decriminalization took place in our, in our cities or in our province here. Uh, you haven't really given a straight answer. You've said, you know, there's, there's no tools. You said it would create issues, create disorder even. Are you suggesting that that crime rates would increase with decriminalization? I'm just trying to, you know, wrap my head around what what the effect of this would be. Yeah, thank you. No, no, the decriminalization on its own, as I said, will not uh, uh, cure some of the issues that we would want to cure. At the same time, it could very much cause uh, additional problems. Um, like I say, right now, it is not uh, legal, and nor would it be in the uh, in a decriminalized environment to to possess small quantities of. Uh, of uh, illicit uh, drugs. But the issues that we're seeing in our communities that are interrelated, the, uh, the issues of homelessness, mental health, addictions, uh, poverty, and these types of things are sort of playing out in the streets in not just, not just here in Calgary, but across Alberta. And so again, if you were just to pull sort of one lever, and if it was going to be the uh, decriminalization lever, all it would do is just make it easier to possess uh, uh, illicit drugs, and also then to see uh, individuals using them in public, using them in spaces there where it's sensitive around, as I mentioned, uh, children and this type of thing, without the tools being there ahead of time. And so I think that's the part that we need to protect community from, is make sure that there's a more of a holistic uh, framework and a, and a broader approach taken with relation to, uh, to uh, any of these issues, to make sure that we're taking into consideration some of the, uh, I guess what I would call the unintended consequences that could arise as a result. Tim, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. Um, I guess just, just going off of that then, what, what would make, uh, let's say Vancouver, what would make Vancouver, the VPD there, ready for decriminalization that maybe the, the uh, Calgary Police Service doesn't have? Or are you maybe suggesting that uh, the VPD isn't ready for this? Well, you'd have to ask the VPD uh, for their uh, for their own own uh, position on it, of course. But I can tell you from uh, our uh, discussions with the BC Association of Chiefs of Police that their position in relation to this issue is the same as ours. We're not ready. Thank you, Tim. Our next question goes to Tegan. Tegan, go ahead. Hi, Tegan Rasha with Chat News and Medicine Hat. Uh, my first question is for Chief Newfeld. Um, what are some differences that smaller cities or rural communities face regarding overdoses and possession compared to bigger cities like Calgary or Edmonton? 
Thanks. Great question, uh, Tegan. Maybe I'll start off and then I might let Chief Warden speak to it since he's representing smaller communities. But, you know, I think the biggest concern from my colleagues when we've discussed this uh, in relation to, uh, you know, looking at this from the perspective of, of different municipalities is that in the smaller uh, and rural communities, the, the types of services that would be required if we're going to divert people uh, out of the criminal justice system through administrative sanctions, those types of services may not be as readily, readily available. So I think it's, it's around capacity in uh, smaller services and the, and the accessibility and availability of, uh, of the services that would be required to support this. Mike, anything to add? No, I think that was uh, pretty much how I would have answered that question as well, uh, Chief. So um, I do know from a from a small center perspective that we are experiencing very similar issues as the bigger centers, just on a different scale. And uh, Chief Newfeld is correct that uh, there's greater access to resources in the larger centers. Of course, it makes sense that there's few, uh, larger populations, and those resources would be uh, more prevalent in the in the bigger centers. So. It is one of the things that we uh, struggle with in the rural and smaller communities is access to the to those resources that are required, whether it be through health or social services or whatever it might be. Um, access to those resources locally uh, to divert um, our citizens to them to help them for that uh, for the recovery of the addiction issues. Hey, and do you have any follow up questions for either chief? Yes, follow up for Chief Warden. What do you think some other harm reduction strategies and policies could help um, in Medicine Hat or rural communities? You know, really another great question. We're uh, we've we've you know this is because of the overdose issue in Medicine Hat and its its rise over this last year. It really has uh, um, brought it to light not only through the police services but social services, our housing community, our city hall, everyone in the municipality has, has a great concern for it. So. Uh, we did put together a team of people uh, because recognizing a uh, um, overdose response group and discussing what are the things that we can do as a group, as a municipality here in Medicine Hat uh, to address the issues. And there are a number of uh, solutions. Uh, all of them, uh, you know, I don't believe any of them are standalone. And this is one of the things that we've talked about is the decriminalization of drugs. It's not a standalone solution. It has to come with other uh, wraparound services uh, that are required. So when you talk about safe supply, when you talk about uh, uh, consumption sites, supervised consumption sites, those are all uh, solutions that may or may not work in certain communities. So I know here in Medicine Hat, uh, we're working with our community and our citizens to try to address this issue to ensure that we can somehow um, address the crisis that we're experiencing and look for long-term solutions. So as, we, as I talked about earlier, our community is asking us to come up with solutions that are that have are effective and have a long term uh, address the issue long term. So it is something that uh, we're working with locally. And I do know uh, some of those solutions are also found in other communities as well. So we're looking uh, province wide to see uh, some of the effects of those. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Tegan. We had one more question that came in by email, and we will have to make this a quick one because I think we're about to lose Chief Newfeld due to a technical uh, difficulty. So the question is, how does the AACP position differ from the CACP position? Thank you, uh, whoever asked that question by email. I actually appreciate that question because it's a very nuanced question. So you would know that uh, most of the uh, the uh, members of AACP are also members of the National Association through CACP. What you'll find is if you look closely, the uh, position between uh, AACP and CACP are actually very close, uh, but they're just expressed differently. What we found is the CACP position that came out uh, in, I believe, 2020 uh, was that we support the notion of decriminalization, but there would have to be certain things in place before that were to happen. In some of the discussions since that time, it seems as though the, uh, the dialogue uh, around the police position has been, been maybe twisted or misunderstood or whatever it is to basically say the, the police support it, you know, sort of quote unquote it without, uh, without being clear about what it is. Uh, so basically what we're doing in Alberta here, recognizing what's happened since then is being very clear that we do not support it at this time because or until certain things are in place. But if you look closely as to what those things would need to be uh, for both the AACP and the CACP, I think you'll find that they're, they're very much the same. Uh, but we are definitely not ready for it here in Alberta. And so we wanted to be very clear that from the perspective of the chiefs of police, 
uh, that is very much the case and we're not yet ready.